Hello, welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Audrey. Hey, hey, from France. Cara. From Germany, hello. And I'm your host, Fen. Hello, hello. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of board games from uh, across the years. Uh, but we're going to start with the standee. Week I was at Audrey's and we played a bunch of different board games in two days uh, in extremely rapid fire. <laughs> yeah. um, so it was it was very interesting. Um, we'll definitely talk about a couple of them today. Um, but uh, more specifically, one that I wanted to to quickly mention was it Iron Zend? Iron Zend, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is a very fun deck building cooperative battler game, but also um, extremely hard. Uh, I, after finishing my first game, I was very confused about how we are supposed to. So I'm probably going to play it uh, on TTS for the next week or so and see if I can figure out the strategy and maybe talk about it. Or if I keep failing at it, I'll also mention that it's a fun, but uh, that I'm rubbish at it. Yeah, oh, we're definitely going to talk about it in the future. I have the actual, which is very, very well implemented. Um, it's uh, it's definitely a great deck builder, for sure. Yeah, it's very fun. Yeah, w- with my boyfriend, we are still stuck at the first uh, boss by Rage thing. I don't know how it's called in English. And we, we, we suck every time. Sometimes we get a power make. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has some really interesting mechanics. Uh, and I think that also answers what you've been up to, Audrey. Yeah, uh, we finished Pandemic Legacy Season Zero with my boyfriend before Alexis uh, visited. I really liked uh, most of the end. I really liked the, the, the end. I really liked the, the game, how the game plays and renews itself over the different uh, months. Uh, there is just one thing that I didn't like at the end. It's that in how you succeed or not doesn't really matter narratively. But uh, it's the same as we discussed with King's Dilemma, in my opinion. My opinion. Uh, but uh, it's the travel that's interesting. And I preferred the travel of uh, Pandemic Legacy Season 0 over King's Dilemma's travel. But just slightly. I think the mechanics and narrative go a bit more together, let's say. Uh, and we went to the, LG, to the LGS uh, Saturday morning and my boyfriend bought uh, Destinies, so I think we are going to look into that very soon. Okay, and uh, Gara? Um, apart from work, finals are coming up, so I have to prepare them. Um, I um, tried out. Um, I um, tried out the new updated version of Endogenesis. It's a card game that was on Kickstarter a while back and had a lot of troubles. And then another Kickstarter came with an expansion and reprint slash upgrade, and um, came with an expansion and reprint slash upgrade. And um, yeah, it's, it's it's okay now. Well, actually, good. Um, though I, it made me think a lot about this whole using Kickstarter backers as um, game te- game testers thing. Um, because the upgrade pack was every single card reprinted because every single card changed. Um, and if only that they added some new icons that told people for which game mode to use, um, something that wasn't uh, done in the first version. And yeah, I, I feel like a lot of the problems could have been addressed with just some rigorous testing beforehand. And that's a pretty big upgrade pack. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 only like 150 cards, but uh, still, yeah, I have the game two times now, and one of them is an unplayable version. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's very important, I think, for designers to value external playtesting, whether you get it from your backers, which I think you get a mixed bag, but it is valuable. Um, you know, you're valuable. Um, you know, you've got people who are fans of what you're doing already, and they're already invested. So, um, 
you can get a varied amount of feedback. Some people will just gush over it, even if it's got problems. Others will be quite like critical. Uh, but I do think just professional external playtesters, like they can play testers, like they can yeah. do so much. You find somebody who's good at breaking systems and trashing them and really like getting into rules or somebody separately who's good at following the flow of a rule book and being like this doesn't make any sense to me um Nijik is fantastic with rule books um gets very angry when the flow it's very angry when the flow doesn't make sense um and that's when i can spot that there's some wording wrong because my brain will like rearrange it automatically and, and put it into a new form that I, I understand what the rules are trying to do but or as written bit um uh, it's different and it's like oh okay yeah that, that's that's it's like oh okay yeah that, that's that's definitely a problem and then there's same with some mechanics where it's like why are they like this and i'm like i don't know they're just like this because that's what the game rules are followed by that's stupid and i'm like yeah i agree it's stupid <laughs> it doesn't make sense now you've yeah. talked about it so yeah definitely 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 Simply using Kickstarter backers, uh, they're often going to be more um, casual player, quote unquote, which is which is good and can give you some good feedback. But they definitely don't have the the same approach or, or rigorous um, look at the rules that that professional play the rules that that professional players can, uh, can have, and it's often disregarded to uh, the to a proper good beta tester, and it's it's very important. I worked in a software development and someone that is good at finding problems or like looking at problems or like looking at user case and trying to replicate how a normal user is going to do things and trying to approach it from uh, an outsider's point of view is incredibly valuable and often um, not, not taken advantage of enough. That's where I liked the... Uh, ab not taken advantage of enough. That's where I liked the uh, update that were, that happened on Midora last week, uh, where they mentioned both that there will be beta testing for backers uh, in a few months for the Acts 2 and 3, but they also talk about uh, where, how they hired someone which is where, how they hired someone which is going to be both a bit of designer and a bit of community manager, and they show uh, the insight that has a new designer he he brought uh, and extra. Uh, new, new, new gameplay elements that he brought, and I think that's something very interesting the, between professional and uh, casual. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's always important for people who are designing games to remember that if you keep going back to the same well of playtesters, especially if they work in house, eventually a meta is going to settle that that's the way you play, and people will just here are the rules, here's the game components, you play learn this you play this and come back to me um and it d can make quite a difference although to be like honest uh the lazy squire games tried doing that with wild ascent they just did it with their backers and that game has a load of minor problems that all should have been all happened there because they had k kickstarter backers playing but i tried to get involved in that and the process of getting to play the game was very awkward so i think they maybe barriered a bunch of people who could have been helpful out just because it was difficult to go through all the steps to get in yeah i've seen something like that before as well um for uh, lex arcana the, um, i actually applied for beta testing and um, was approved and when i got the materials for beta testing it was basically, okay, now we have one week to uh, play this first scenario with your group and give us feedback. And I was like, I can't get my group together in one time to plan it. And that was the end of it. Um, and also I do play tests for two games um, currently or like for half a year now. And um, so I know it's really easy to miss small things. And that's what you said, you have to switch it up. You have to switch it up. You have to get different people on the game at different stages um, because it's so interesting. Like we play the game for six, six months and suddenly someone new comes in, plays it for the first time and says, hey, why is that so? And we look at it and say, that's a good question. We didn't notice that. Why is that so? And we look at it and say, that's a good question. We didn't notice that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, which games are that, if you can disclose? Um, EOS, Island of Angels, and the upcoming expansion for Tsukuyumi, Sunrise Kingdom, both from King Raccoon Games. Oh. I'll definitely... Kingdom, both from King Raccoon Games. Oh. I'll definitely be looking into that then, knowing that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you participated in Phoenix. Yeah, yeah, it's all uh, pretty... Pretty interesting stuff. Yep. Hello. Oh, what's okay. this? Cute. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Cute. Their new challenger comes music. Hey, it's, da, 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 the, the fifth, uh, it's, it's the fifth country of the podcast. So you can tell us what you've been up to right now. You're on the spot. What have you been up to? Oh, actually, uh, uh, well, we are past a lot of uh, football <laughs> matches or so. It's football. We're in Europe. It's football. Our congrats. That's a no. It happened, so let, let's not delve <laughs> in the past. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, uh, I actually have been bashed by uh, solo card playing game engine these days. I played a lot of Spire's End. There are, it's like uh, a solo kind of dungeon crawler, but it's horror themed adventure you play, and uh, it has a. 15 uh, endings or something like that. I don't know. I, I, I disclosed an ending which is like ending 15. So I, I think there are at least 15. And uh, they, they are one worse than the other. <laughs> and to get six of them uh, until now. Um, kind of a cool game. Uh, uh, also, I begin to feel the grind. Wonderful. Possibly we, we will talk about it or not, it depends. Let's see if, if, I, if I find a good ending. Anyway, on 13th of July, I think in uh, a Kickstarter for the sequel to it, or it's actually a prequel, uh, Spires and Hildegard, I will back it. Ooh, I'm not sure. I'm interested, um, because Spires End's hard to get, but I'm not sure if I'm interested if it's a prequel, because... I hate prequels as a concept. I really don't care because I kind of there's the in character. You know where it ends. You do, you do. It's like I I know people have praised it, but I didn't. I just wasn't interested in watching Rogue One. That's exactly how I feel about a, a Marvel movie, which is right now in the out in the in the rooms, and I'm not going to disclose my name. Everyone knows, and yeah, actually, so done. I am going to disclose. <laughs> I disclose my name. Everyone knows, and. Yeah, actually, so he's done. I am going to disclose. <laughs> I am going to disclose the name because actually, I agree in some extent that movie should have been taken place before Infinity Wars. It was really good, and it would have added more to Infinity Wars. And I think, like, if I ever watch this fresh new, I don't know if I had like like suffered amnesia or something. Like, if I ever watch this fresh new, I don't know if I had like like suffered amnesia or something. I would that that's the I would watch that video that movie before uh, before Infinity Wars. But, but I really enjoyed it. I'm pondering if I have to go on that because prequels. The the thing the thing is the last Jedi for me was the like, because prequels. The the thing the thing is the last Jedi for me was the like already Force Awakens I was a bit flag tired and like yeah I I grew up with the Phantom Menace stuff but once I've watched the others. Um, I was like, I don't really watch the Phantom Menace stuff anymore because the only good part in that is Palpatine. Uh, and so for me, but once I've watched the others, um, I was like, I don't really watch the Phantom Menace stuff anymore because the only good part in that is Palpatine. Uh, and so for me, when I finally watched The Last Jedi, I was like, nope, okay, uh, Disney don't know what they're doing with this anymore. Um, and I'm... I, I'm kind of over it. I'm kind of over Star Wars. I don't know when I finally watched The Last Jedi. I was like, nope, okay, uh, Disney don't know what they're doing with this anymore. Um, and I'm I, I'm kind of over it. I'm kind of over Star Wars. I don't know whether I've just grown out of it or if it is the way everything's gone. It or if it is the way everything's gone. So that's been the biggest thing that's happened to me. Oh, I, I also I also got from Book Depository, uh, which is a great Scottish source for Osprey Games stuff. Uh, I got uh, Imperium Classics, so I, I will eventually play it. Not Legends, because Imperium Imperium all kicking around Imperium Classics, and I'm like, but Legends is the really interesting one. 
Yeah, uh, I just figured that uh, to understand if I like the game, uh, I needed the, the most basic factions. Since Arthurians and Atlanteans from Legends have uh, a lot of special rules, I, I think I kept them for later in case I like Um, it's It's a very good game, um, but takes a bit too long to operate. Which is one of those things which is frustrating, but uh, I I do think it is it's got a lot. We've talked about it already uh, briefly, um, yeah. So we won't go back around it again today, but uh, yeah, yeah. And um, I also um, finally I picked up Anachrony now that the Essential Edition's out, which is the version without all of the stuff. And then I went, oh, I've got this nice you know Anachrony Essential Edition. I'm gonna go get the mix. The stupid pointless plastic mechs. I'm gonna go get them because they make me happy. And I, I've at the end doesn't quite make it into a like a nine out of ten game, but it's still between a seven and an eight. But you get your little mech, and then you slot your worker token into the top of the mech, and then you send them out onto the ho inhospitable surface of the planet to do stuff. And that is so much more satisfying than putting a worker token on top of a mech. <laughs> They're works of art. They really are. There's just like um, four different designs, and they are amazing. I I I think that's the reason I bake the stuff from uh, Eon Trespass Odyssey because you can stuff miniatures on top of miniatures. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's miniatures on top of miniatures. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is just a uh, cardboard <laughs> on top of miniatures, but yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> eventually every board game is just going to end up as a big, exciting balancing act where you're putting everything on top of everything else. But, uh, you know, not yet. We're not there yet. But, uh, you know, not yet. We're not there yet. We will get there unless everything will be up-based, but we will get to that. Well, uh, I think it's time that we started talking about our actual um, uh, subjects for the uh, for the episode. So, Audrey, would yes. you like to uh, tell us all about... Yes, our first game today is going to be Above and Below. Above and Below is a narrative competitive board game which is based, based on a worker placement mechanic where you will have build a village but this village extends above and below the surface of the earth where the title comes from ha so the idea is that your villagers will able to do various actions there aren't many actions there will be the action to recruit a villager the action to work to generate to build a house either above or below the surface, the action to uh, get resources, and the action to explore. The exploration is the mechanic where the workers will explore below the surface and uh, see grottos, explore below the surface and uh, see grottos where they will then build the outposts which can generate resources, uh, generate uh, victory points, generate gold, uh, etc. How to build um, an outpost or a house, uh, etc. How to build um, an outpost or a house, you just need coin and then they will, you will get the resources, the victory points, uh, etc. Honestly, it's a game where the explanation of the rules is very fast. A game where the explanation of the rules is very fast. I, I think that it, it goes quite fast because you don't have many requirements to do any actions. The things are quite self-explanatory. There are many symbols everywhere. so except for the adventure book, which goes for the Grotto's exploration, you can language people. Yeah, uh, so I um, uh, we played that game together, so Audrey explained the game. I think that it took under 20 minutes to explain the full things. Um, and definitely, if you just have the, uh, the symbol explanation uh, page next to you, you can just jump into the game pretty uh, in, in just five seconds. And if you want to play with a different edition, you just need a, a native speaker that speaks the language of the exploration book, or uh, they they can probably sell those separate. It's it's very easy and interesting. On that that level, the design is is quite um, lean, I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's um, 
it, it, it's really easy to jump into and the concept's kind of nice and simple with this hey you're building a new village from scratch after this like your last one was ransacked by a bunch of barbarians so perhaps this time you might want to invest in some defenses but you know whatever just just build houses and uh, uh and i but you know whatever just just build houses and uh, uh and i love the artwork to this game in particular like i feel that Ryan Lockett's art, and he's very much uh, an all-in-one kind of, I don't know whether there's a board game term for it, but you'd call him an auteur, maybe, or, or, or it, something if he was doing films. He's, he's got a great, or, or it, something if he was doing films. He's, he's got a great vision of this world that he's been constructing, and uh, I, I just love it. I, every single character, when I get them, no matter who I get, they just speak to me in some way, whether it's because of their outlandishly giant moustache, or cute scarf or whatever it's and, and the scarf or whatever it's and, and the design of the houses as well like oh uh, everything is pretty neat and cute yeah it's it's so adorable and brilliant um and it is very light yeah it's very light but we haven't talked about the narrative aspect that takes place when you explore the grottoes because when you explore the grottoes because you will have to give uh, the book to the other players, if they can read it, of course, because if you have just one native player, actually, it's a bit annoying for the book. Because you have to read a piece of lore, which says, okay, you are exploring a grotto, and here you see uh, mushrooms and fruits which are playing a game of chess. Playing a game of chess. They look like they're set up like a game of chess. Okay. And then the, peop the player that has the rule book in hand continue reading and say, okay, so you have the possibility to, let's say, uh, Continue playing the game of chess or steal the, the fruits. What do you do? And with each choice, you have a, diffi a difficulty level associated, which will be exploration. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something. And behind every choice, you have the rewards associated with the choice written. And you don't tell the rewards. You just say, if you play the game of chess, you can uh, get some get something if you score exploration 3 get something else if you score exploration 5 if you choose to steal the things you have something if you get exploration 4 and then the active player makes the roll which gives lanterns depending on the villagers involved in the exploration action and depending on the result the result they get the rewards or they don't or they can exhaust villagers to improve their result to get the rewards and that's where the narrative comes in play because every time that you explore a new grotto you will discover a new piece of the world you will discover yeah that there are mushrooms which are alive um you you will figure out oh okay so in this world there are uh, pig creatures but they're nice okay and you will figure out bit by bit what I really enjoyed with that is that the world seems to be um, really colorful and, and fun. Uh, we, we played it just a little bit and big tenant trees at best if you really focus on the exploration. So th that book seems to be con constantly going to be uh, showing you something new. Like I, I would be surprised if you saw the same entry uh, multiple times over, over multiple games. Uh, it seems to be really, really... Although some of the entries are like multiple parts of depending what, depending on what choices you do. So yeah, it takes a long time to have a repeat of an entry. And even if it does, you can't be like, ooh, last time I saw those mushrooms playing chess, I stomped them both flat. Maybe I shouldn't do that this time. Perhaps I will talk to them and uh, I'll give them some of my food. And then one of them can join your village and they're all really cool. No, we didn't find... Uh... I had two plays under my belt so far, and no, we didn't meet uh, any special villagers yet. Uh, the main thing that annoys me in the game is that, yes, as Alexis said, it's short. It, it feels short, resources. Uh, you feel like, yeah, now I have the time to, um, to reap those resources and put them in my resource track, and and actually, no, you don't have the time to fill that resource. Like the resource track feels very big to me compared to how much you can really put into, or maybe to uh, optimize uh, what I can uh, build for resource houses and outposts and put the resources in my uh, resource track. But yeah, it feels, I will not say limited, but restricted by the time, which is a constraint in many games. So that's okay in a way, but it's limited by the time, which 
is a constraint in many games, so that's okay in a way, but it leaves me always with a f small feeling of frustration. Yeah, um, I, as we played, it kind of felt like you have to focus on one type of play, and that if you try to diversify yourself too much, uh, you're quickly going to on one type of play, and that if you try to diversify yourself too much, uh, you're quickly going to be, get limited. I, I started the game trying to explore because I saw that exploration book, and it looked incredibly fun and fun of full entries and. Uh, I I immediately threw a couple of villages there and then realized uh, I I immediately threw a couple of villages there and then realized that oh exploration is actually really hard and if you fail an exploration you get nothing um, so it's it's kind of a, a waste of resources in the early game unless you're lucky and by the time you're by the time I felt like I had a, a proper team to, to go investigate, it was already in the end of the game and I couldn't I couldn't get there. But Audrey was lucky to get a, a good villager from the start. Yeah, I stole it from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they were able to, to really die there and that, that generated some, some good resources. It's it's an interesting game and I feel like having a, a few more plays under my belt would uh, would help um, get to it better. But I I liked it, but I think that the exploration book could be could be more uh, front and center, uh, maybe with different tiers of exploration. Of them. Yeah, you can definitely tell this is like an early design from from Ryan that uh, he's just kind of exploring the concepts because it does everything well. Uh, it does a nice worker placement game. Uh, it it's nicely written. I didn't, don't think I ever found an encounter where I've been like, oh, I. I I think that's badly worded. They've all been at least. I, I I think that's badly worded. They've all been at least fine to great. Um, and at times have you know elected a, a laugh from people around the board. But uh, yeah, it's it it is. It's only seven rounds. So once you get used to playing it a fair bit, you have to hit the ground running with what you want to do. And often the villagers you get often the villagers you get will determine where you're going to go. You're not going to be doing a lot of exploration if your villagers are bad at exploring, for example. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it does hold up in replays, uh, and I like that it is fairly fast and light, but I do agree that it can feel unsatisfying. I do agree that it can feel unsatisfying because you really start getting momentum um, just at the time when the game goes, all right, wrap up, wrap it up, you're done. Yeah. I actually feel different. Go ahead. That's interesting. I um, when I play with my friends, it was one of those rare games. When I play with my friends, it was one of those rare games where no one cared about the points. First of all, no one knew how many points themselves or the others had because um, scoring is distributed over many different things, and it's near to impossible to keep track of it over many different things, and it's near to impossible to keep track of your own points during the game, plus where the others stand, and um, so it was really a fun experience no one had to care about any points or something we just built our villages and we just built our villages and we had so much fun with these stories um, i know some people criticize um, that it's totally random yeah you pick a card you roll a die one of those six numbers uh, on the card tell you which story. you have one random encounter of these 215 but um, I think, first of all, it's very thematic because, well, you just go somewhere underground and look what is there. So there doesn't have to be a clear like storyline behind it. Um, and um, it's, it leads to really just fun encounters. It's, I mean, there are encounters that are like somewhat more serious, like I don't know, you find some traveler that is lost and you can decide to help them find the way or maybe rob them or whatever. Uh, and it's often like you have a shot being bad. And um, and then there are encounters. I know one of my encounters was I somehow got into like a singing match with some mushrooms. And... Um, <laughs> 
it's it's just so weird and random and we had so hearing world ryan lauk had built there um, where these serious things um, are next to these totally random and just funny encounters and um yeah and it was really from start to finish we just had fun with the game at the end i have no idea who won because no one had to have won but um whatever we just had fun with it and actually i mean you've played some games with me you know i like to crunch things and um yeah i i played red scattered well with you i know how I know how you get. <laughs> but yeah, with this yeah. game, I was really. <laughs> but yeah, with this yeah. game, I was really. I don't care. I'm just having fun. You you know what? Um, I I I don't know if I we I didn't get as far as talking about that part of it in detail. I'm glad you did because that is the endearing part for me. Is and part of the reason why I feel the endearing part for me is and part of the reason why I feel when you get seventh round and it's time to stop and pack up I'm like oh because I've just reached a point where I could really start like oh maybe I could do an explore eight check Ooh, that's that's a bit normally I've heard about those and I want to avoid doing that um, so it's it's this desire to get more time to engage with time to engage with the, the, the storybook which is really your interface with this world below your village that is so exciting although um is it? It's kind of amusing how bland your village is at the top compared to all of this stuff beneath. But I, I think that's the point. That I know it's, it's so colorful under it. I, I will say that that actually, I, I think that uh, the the merging of the exploration part and the worker placement part is done really, really extremely well. Usually, I, I wouldn't touch a game like this with a three foot pole, like uh, three feet pole, like they say because uh, uh, sand stuff will destroy the game. But I have to say that, uh, and I, I have not, no direct experience, I only spectated games uh, these times to, to get on par for, to, to talk about this, but I have to say it just looks fun. It looks silly fun, it is uh, perfectly merged and above, and uh, when you get, uh, when you build enough stuff uh, to have your injured rest, uh, you can explore more. So actually, it is uh, a, a great merge. It is. Uh, I think that the biggest merit of this game is that it merged two things. It is. Uh, I think that the biggest merit of this game is that it merged two things so different, and it is fun as a result. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the the writing, I, I just was like looking at the worker placements again, and uh, with worker placement tokens, and I was reminded just how more important the workers feel uh, with worker placement tokens, and I was reminded just how more important the workers feel in this game than they do in others. So in a lot of worker placement games, you just have a generic meeple or maybe a round brown disc um or an animal yeah, pole yeah yeah maybe an animal meeple but in this like every single worker but in this like every single worker has their own separate piece of artwork and for me this would result in times where i would just get very annoyed if i couldn't get the merfolk person the fish person <laughs> or the frog and there's only one frog and one merfolk in like the the pool that I'm looking oh, at here. He stole the merperson on the first turn. Uh, he's a merperson. Yeah. Merperson on the first turn. Uh, he's a merperson. Yeah, the merfolk. Yeah, you won me my the, game. It, it was on the the lowest track to buy uh, to buy a new uh, citizen. It costed nothing. I saw it and I was like, oh, yeah. those are good stats. I need to jump on. Oh, oh we got it. First yeah. player. Yeah. Also, also, also the. Yeah. Also, 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 the twist of having the different stats on each worker is actually yeah. a smart idea. And with the, with the different artwork, I mean, everyone starts mechanically with the same workers, but still, you start the game by drafting them because, of course, you don't want any, because, of course, you don't want any worker. You want the one that looks the way you want him to look. So, you want to pick this one, even though he does the same thing as the others. Yeah, I often pick workers based on how glorious their mustache is if they're male, because that's a, that's a good criteria to have. And I love the favorite of mine, um, but uh, it's oh, th this artwork is just wonderful and adds so much to the game along with the writing. It's it feels like a big world and uh, so much so that you want to go back to it. 
and luckily, luckily we can. You get to go. Uh, well, you can go back, but you can also explore more far away or more nearer. So that leads us to. Uh, <laughs> it was a very bad. This is terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so near and far, great game. Let's skip this topic now. I'm ashamed by myself. <laughs> and ashamed by myself. And my transition try. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's you, fine. You, you jumped in on the transition. You wanted to take it. I was getting towards a near and far. But, uh, <laughs> this is th this is where you've landed. I mean, next time you might want to think about it here and now. Isn't, isn't it? I mean, next time you might want to think about it here and now. Isn't, isn't it? Uh, here and now. He's about to close. Now, now, now or never. It's now or never. Now or never. Closer and further. <laughs> Up and down, yes. Okay, well, tell us all about Near and Far. Yeah, so Near and Far came out uh, two years after Above and Below. Yeah, so Near and Far came out uh, two years after Above and Below. Um, also by Ryan Laukett, designed and designed. Um, so Illustrations, too. Yeah. He's a full stack designer. Yeah, it's and um, first of all, you will feel right at home. If you know above and you unpack near and far you will feel right at home you immediately recognize the style um, and um, the story now is basically a couple years after above and below you know the, um, people founded new villages and um, now you have basically like a whole just this village but um, you are playing adventurers and um, or heroes that um, gather adventurers around them and explore this world. Um, there is an overlying story um, here because you have different game modes. You have the uh, first game, uh, which is used like as an introduction to the game to get to know the mechanics. You have the arcade mode, which is basically like, okay, you put it on a table, play a game and put it away again. And then you have the character and the campaign mode. Uh, the character mode focuses on the stories of the different characters you can play, uh, while the campaign mode focuses on the story of the world, and um, which is basically like this: are uh, these rumors about this lost city, and um, you're qu you are on a quest to find this city and play over um, eleven maps. So it's not just one map where you play. You have 11 different maps. It's the first time that Ryan Lockett not only has an encounter book with all these stories, but also an atlas book um, where you can choose a map to play on, or if you play the campaign mode, play one map after another. Um, of course, of course, switching up the game each time. Yeah, spo spoiler, e we will use that <laughs> in, fo in following games. <laughs> Yeah, um, some mechanics are more or less the same. Um, there are also some integrations with above and below. Um, you have, instead of work, also some integrations with above and below. Um, you have, instead of work, as adventurers you uh, get and put into your crew. Um, you can use these adventurers in above and below as workers. On the back side, they have the symbols for above and below. Um, so like a mini expansion, right? They have the symbols for above and below. Um, so like a mini expansion and um, maybe there is one adventurer you really like and you can just use them in both games. And um, here we, they don't give like new actions, but they give a uh, skill point. They give uh, skill points. Uh, there are um, two skills basically like um, fighting and ability yeah something um basically it's a hand and a sword yeah and um when you have an encounter you way you roll the die and add your swords you have from your adventurers or from items you got and stuff like that while if you uh, try to i don't know persuade someone you have to add all the hands you've got um yeah and um, one hands and this is also like when the game ends once one player has placed all their camps it's the last turn and um, 
the camps first of all give points but also they increase the your reach because if you try to explore somewhere where you don't have, you can just go further without losing stamina so it really feels like you are increasing the area you can explore over the course of a game Th that seems that seems very uh interesting as a as a concept like the the exploration is, seems to be much more in the uh on focus the game yeah um though well, what i really like most games use victory points and it's i mean sure in the end it's about who has the most points and this person has the victory so of course they are victory points but really just changing the name changes the feeling for me and in this game it really fits the theme because you just travel and experience things and you get points for that so it's who has the best the better stories yeah and so i really thing i've heard with different games like kdm uh, talk a lot about kdm uh, talk a lot about emergent storytelling and i feel like near and far does this really well um, even like in one game um, you have your own story yeah so okay how you try to connect this trade route or how you help have your own story yeah so okay how you try to connect this trade route or how you help the shopkeeper in this town and um how you made friends with the leader of the nomads and all these things happen in a game and create your mads and all these things happen in a game and create your own story and i really love that yeah i um i love how when you go you play above and below and you move on to near and far how not only do you see a growth in the world and the way far how not only do you see a growth in the world and the way it's set uh, but also a growth in the mechanics and the, the extra depth of the game you can see somebody like refining their craft and really getting to i've done this i want to do this and this and this interestingly near and far in the early stages of kickstarter had a lot more in the early stages of kickstarter had a lot more area control elements to it um so it was far more sort of rushed to get on the map and kind of dominate areas and there's still a little bit of that left and you're placing tents and things but it became more about the journey as the as things evolved and that's one of the as things evolved and that's wonderful because you've got this constant tension of everybody starts in the village and oh okay i'm going to go out on this adventure i'm going to explore this part of the spiral book uh, again i want to just say i love the use of like books as boards because it tightens up the play area so much um, reducing the size. I kind of want, uh, uh, I want uh, an animal to carry some stuff. Yeah, sure. But somebody else is like looking and going, I'll just go with what I've got here. And then you're like, no, no, but but you're going to get to go out and experience the world and have all the strange, interesting story adventures. And uh, I'm not ready yet. So I guess I have to go as well. And it's that nice kind of constant with a, with a string and a hat. That'll do me. I have to say that I prefer narrative games when they are cooperative generally because uh, when it's like that, the, this tension that you are describing in something that I don't really personally like to experience. So you like cooperative games? You are in luck. Near and Far has an expansion Amber Mines which comes with several modules you can add to the game and one of those modules is a cooperative module where you can basically play any game mode from the core game in co-op. That sounds yes! great. Uh, have you tried that mode? Game in co-op. That yes! sounds great. Uh, have you tried that mode or is it not yet out yet? Uh, well, it's out already. Um, it's been it, out since... It's out in French already as well. Yeah, and um, it's... It's great. Um, there are no hidden information, so even though it's officially for two to four players, it's great. Um, there are no hidden information, so even though it's officially for two to four players, you can also play it uh, alone. And um, with, you know, just take two characters and play both of them. And uh, it becomes some kind of a puzzle, you know, um, because uh, you have some kind of a puzzle, you know, um, because uh, you have a time limit and the longer you take to finish the game, the more points you need to win. And um, 
<clears throat> and yeah, it's the story you create change. Now it's uh, a collective story. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, this character tried to um, focus on getting in league with the um, outlaws, while this one tried to get in league with the mystics and. Um, they decided beforehand um, who would control which trade roads. <clears throat> yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, uh, I, I have two observations about this. The first one is that it looks like every single one of you is uh, recording this podcast while having a web page open on breadspielprice.de. <laughs> Like, like, let's find this expansion right now. Oh, it's here in French. <laughs> After no, that... <laughs> I knew it already because it's at my LGS. <laughs> okay. The the second observation is actually uh, the near and far just juxtaposition in this game is done very very well. Extra juxtaposition in this game is done very very well. Actually. Uh, I, I played the introductory scenario and uh, I had to say uh, I wanted to go out and explore mostly. I found myself returning back to the city because I needed the deadly. I found myself returning back to the city because I needed the action, the action selection part that is fully and completely merged even better than above and below and actually it makes sense for you to go back. Also, the, the cool part, which was also a gripe with uh, now, it makes sense the events you are, uh, you are getting. If you are by a lake, you will see the lake in the story event you will play when you explore. And that's super cool. That's actually a, a big important evolution. Also, the spiral bound atlas, like fancy games, I, 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 that was the single idea I liked most uh, out of uh, Gloom Avengers of the Lion. I like it here. I will. I actually liked it in uh, Sleeping Gods. Whenever we will talk about it, so cool. It reduces the amount of components in the game as well. You don't have there and spiral bound is not exactly the the the, the thickest mat material there is, but. Uh, I think it shortens uh, the time it takes to put the game to play. It allows you to expand it by just adding two pages. So there's a lot you can do with that. And uh, of course, uh, uh, just imagine what you can do with two books. Like again, uh, it will happen in, sl in Sleeping Gods. Uh, I had a, a one more question if one of you has tried that. Um... How does it feel to play above and below and then near and far in the uh, like in in following session, uh, quote unquote? Like, do, do the game feel like they're part in the same um, uh, in the same hole? Do they feel a bit at odds, or like, do, does near and far feels like a straight evolution that uh, takes over what above and below does? Uh, be because it seems like since they have the same sort of story, it would be interesting to play uh, above and below and then and then move on to near and far. Well, um, I've played them in close succession with each other. I played uh, I played above and below when it first came out. I played near and far when it first came out. I also played them afterwards. In came out. I also played them afterwards in uh, together. Um, they definitely feel like the same world. The, the continuous nature of the art style, uh, the writing being consistent. You have the same people returning to write for, for Near and Far, who wrote in Above and Below, which is um, Ryan Lockett, uh, Matt, uh, Mallory Lockett, and Alf Seergert, and they're joined by Brenna Asplund for the writing here. Uh, it's clear that Ryan um, and his writers have a, clear, a very strong vision for the, the, the world and the direction they're taking it in. Also, they, they're definitely different games. Above and Below Below is, while you have this exploration in the book, it's not moving around on a map. It's going down and having one encounter that you decide what to do with on your branching path of choices, make your roles come back to the surface. Whereas Near and Far is you're out, you're moving around a map, you're deciding when there are forks, which way to go, whether you want to head towards this, this named place or go explore up near this forest, things like that. Um, so... 
they build on one another, they complement one another. I do think it's clear that Near and Far is the more accomplished of the two, but that's just to be expected because it came out two years after Above and Below, and Ryan has just shown he's gone from strength to strength as he's figured out figured out what he wants to do with his writing and his games and his worlds. Um, and, you know, I can only just, I can't wait for the next one in this series to come out. Yeah, uh, sometime this year, right? Yep. Pre-orders are open, yep. so I guess that the sign is in final stages, mm. if not complete. Um, I think... I, if not complete. Um, I think, I, I mean, I haven't played them in close succession to each other, but what I like to add, um, first of all, yeah, it feels like one world, but with near and far, it get, just gets so vast um, that it's actually like you can go away from above and below. I mean, above and below on the first map of near and far. So there you can actually go to the village you built and see what they are up to. And um, which is actually quite interesting. Um, this event, I had this event and um, I won't spoil it, but it's, it's really cool to visit a few years. What are you people up to now? And, um, and of course you encounter on the first map uh, the same um, type of people and it's 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 very familiar everything but um yeah you can play consistent. chess again with the mushrooms <laughs> but um oh those shrooms are love love chess <laughs> the further you travel the, the more different the world becomes it's just you have to just have to flip through the um world uh, atlas and can see how the world changes and um yeah so I guess near and far is a very fitting title. Changes, <laughs> and um, yeah. So I guess near and far is a very fitting title. <laughs> yeah, if you get far enough into it without talking about spoilers, there's a couple of pages that will make you like look at and go, "Ooh, that reminds me of Sleeping Gods." Like the design, it's um, the the Rock Tooth Islands pages, and it's it really is like it's um, the the Rock Tooth Islands pages, and it's it really is like it's it's like a precursor to. Uh, to sleeping gods though um, i don't think they are it's set not, in the same world then they're not but i meant like conceptually you look at the visuals and this is like oh oh okay i can see this maybe had some hand in the genetics of and see this maybe had some hand in the genetics of the way that the world of sleeping gods looks because it's it's like a proto proto map for that one um wait so i'm i'm very ill prepared about sleeping guts is sleeping guts by the same designer yes, yes. it is it is yeah oh, it's... that explains so much i know i understand the team of the episode that explains so much i know i understand the team of the episode now <laughs> <laughs> i mean i, I thought it was just like narrative games but no it's actually it's, it's actually more than that yeah oh. <laughs> it's okay it's, alexis was in vacation it, it's it's more of that it's also we're basically doing our prep work and groundwork before before we start talking about sleeping gods basically doing our prep work and groundwork before we start talking about sleeping gods because it's really good to go back and look at these two and see the evolution and honing of this craft that yeah. then created i think a game that is just going to be considered to be one of the best games of all time i i don't think it's too too wrong this is going to land in the end so i might skip near and far and just get sleeping gods yeah i I have not yet had the time to uh, to play Sleeping Gods, unfortunately, but it's been I've been eyeing it up for a while now, and I truly regret not to have uh, joined up on the the Kickstarter campaign when I saw it passed. Yeah, a physical copy because uh, Red Raven kind of underproduced, and now it's a mess to get the physical copies anyway. I'm sure for it will, each it and will every get game. A yeah, I, I, I'm getting it from a pre-order, but it's very, very late. I'm playing it on on, uh, on emulator, and uh, it's not an official mod, but it's kind of tolerated. So uh, it's a way to play it while you wait for the real thing. As most time with narrative games, I'm waiting for the French version because as well with my boyfriend, it's much easier. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is easy. much easier. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is easier when it's translated to your native language. Not that I'll ever get that. I don't think anyone would ever do a Welsh edition. <laughs> well, <laughs> I actually uh, stick though. to the English versions for um, Red Raven games, but that's because I have a personal gripe with the German uh, games. But that's because I have a personal gripe with the German uh, publisher 
So <laughs> they are no go for me. That's fair enough. That's fair yep. enough. Actually, it would be really great to have an exploration adventure game with a uh, original sort of um. Uh, legislation adventure game with a uh, original sort of um, uh, legendary Welsh poems. Yes, they're uh, well. the The problem is that um, they've been very like um, uh, gathered up by the English and the French and like used for their own purposes. So um, reclaiming, them. but uh, you'd also have to look into the Irish because there's a lot of crossover between the two yeah. like, blending of concepts. But yeah. There's a good uh, tradition of, uh, of epic poems, uh, epic in the original uh, term of the world. Uh, Le- that, oh, that to make it easier, it's possible to make the game in its uh, symbol way, language elements. Yeah, that's is this is. a transition? No, it's not, because I I'm not <laughs> finished. I wanted to talk about uh, a cu- one mechanic in near and far that amused me no end. Before we do wrap up. Um, uh, I've been trying to just jump in, but we got we got caught up talking about the other bits and pieces. And um, that is the dueling mechanic, which yeah. the world, uh, the village section where you're choosing where to go is like many worker placement games. It, you one person per space, but it's not quite that. If somebody's at a space you want to go to, you can go there and then you have to engage them in a duel for the right to be there. Um, now, the, what the stakes are is all for the right to be there. Um, now, the, what the stakes are is, if you win, you get to be there. If you lose, you don't get to be there. The other person you go to prison. <laughs> no, no. If you play, if, yeah, you could go to yeah, you can go to prison. Yeah, but uh, and then try again next turn or whatever. But the stakes are kind of so unbelievably low for the person who's defending. The stakes are kind of so unbelievably low for the person who's defending that they're not really even defending. They're just like, I don't, I don't really care if you're here, but my character does. Like, you're crowding their space, so get the hell out of it. Uh, I, I just found it so funny because it's it, it's actually a pointless funny because it's it, it's actually a pointless mechanic. It really, like, if you're going to have conflict between two people in a space uh, on a worker placement style mechanic, which the village bit is, then maybe there should be stakes for both players so they actually get engaged but they're not it's like one person's really i really need to go here you yeah okay i mean <laughs> I, I think, i'm not bothered yeah i think the only reason for this is really um to have an active way to change your reputation because in a duel you can decide do you fight honorably then your reputation will increase or you do do you fight dirty then it will decrease and some artifacts can get guns. Reputation. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you have a cool artifact and know, ah, I need minus three reputation so I can get it. Hey, I'll duel you, and I fight dirty. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. does make sense as a, a mechanical way to do it. Um, and and this that carries it from above and below has that same kind of kind of not player versus player, but you can do naughty stuff and your reputation drops, which I yeah we hadn't talked about at that point so. Maybe that's a reason, but it's still. It, I, why isn't the defending person more involved in some manner? I don't. I don't know. It's. Uh, it is indeed um, an amusing point, but I think it is indeed um, an amusing point. But I think we could say for sure that uh, that this is a. It's a delight to play near and far. It really is. Um, as like above and below is quite whimsical and will suck you in and let you sort of spend 90 minutes let you sort of spend 90 minutes just kind of experience in this world and the own little stories that you give your people and then near and far just does expand that out and take you off to this like hey it's not just this one place with this weird stuff happening in below it's all this here i mean there's constructs here I mean, there's constructs. You can play as one. He's my favourite character to play as. It's just a big, giant, lumbering bro- hunk of bronze, I think, is the only way to describe him. Or, I say him, it. It's adorable. But, yeah, as you we were saying, though, it is. there's certainly another way you can do things. And that is... There's certainly another way you can do things. And that is to, uh, to ha- have your components be as language-neutral as possible... Um, and then have an app with multiple different languages do the heavy lifting. And that brings us to the third game, which is not a Ryan Lockett game. Um, it's actually um, it's actually from somebody I've talked about in the past, and it's from the other 
company i think that really leans on storybook style games and that's forgotten waters from isaac vega uh, j arthur ellis and mr bistro which is <laughs> my favorite designer name ever like that has to be a suit like that has to be a pseudonym it's it, it so we, forgotten waters is a three to seven player almost party game in some ways um adventure game set in a whimsical world of pirates where you're members of a crew of a ship that's doing something in the case of the first story in the case of the first story which is the only one i really want to spoil at all um lightly is you're trying to sail off the beyond the world's edge which is this mythical section on the left side of the board that's covered in clouds and nobody's ever been through there but captain captain vance captain jessabut j vance vance captain jessabut j vance uh your captain that's what he wants to do so you guys are there along for the ride to help him out um Everyone will get one or more roles, depending on the number of players, and your job is essentially you're tracking one aspect of the ship. So the Cooper will be handling supplies, the Botswain will be sort of supplies, the Botswain will be sort of dealing with the hull, the ship's scribe will be recording any important story events that untrack. Um, and what I love about this in particular, kind of like above and below, is the rules teach is pretty like fast and light. Because the app is doing so much of the heavy lifting, the app is doing so much of the heavy lifting that you just need to t to say to people, here's the map. You move around on the map like one hex at a time. Uh, you draw hex tiles if there's nothing on there. You might scout them, find them in advance. Then when you get to a location, you flip open the location book and you, you just say, okay, we're going to have 40 seconds. You're going to have to pick something here. You're going to have to pick something here. The only rules are if it's red, one person has to go there. If it's blue, only one person can go there. If it's green, anyone can. Okay, grab your standee, decide where you're going. Um, physically, this is kind of a lot of fun, especially with more players, because you're sort of like trying to get past each other. Everyone goes down and suddenly you all look and, and nobody's the game will punish you because the crew will get discontent. If the crew gets too discontent, then game over. If the boat sinks, game over. You know, if you run out of supplies, then the crew doesn't get fed, they get discontent, and you can lose the game that, that way. So I, I love that part of it. Um, it's a little harder to teach on uh, the category, but it was definitely a contender for it. Um, yeah, the, the app works very well, except when you go to a non, like a random location. So, so some locations have fixed events for that given story and some of the where you make decisions and you alter the path, but some of them just have like a random thing happens. Kind of then have to sort of either have one person read or everyone re-roll the entry until we all get the same result so we can actually see what's happening and follow along. I think you can just zoom and share screen on the web app. Yeah, you could do, but uh, that's um, that. It, it, it's an extra bunch of steps to deal with um, of the app, because if you want it in your own native tongue, you can have that, um, which, which can help a great deal. Or uh, if you want to read, you can read it, or you can click play and have this chap read it to you in a pretty, pretty nice set of narration. He's quite piratical, piratical, quite pirate-like in the way that he yeah have it happened during the session we played but i had a wonderful series of playing with um profi and greg and all the guys and profi who's the biggest brawniest pirate out of all of us in that particular run um he kept running into people and accidentally murdering them in combat and there was this, this series, so little gertie like he runs somebody down in battle who uh he murdered and then this lady with two eye patches had a go at him for doing it and said she was the apple of all of our eyes or to paraphrase and and he was like oh, oh well and then in another fight later he kills somebody else on the crew by accident it turns out to be that lady with two eye patches who like he tries to save her and then accidentally murders her because he's not good at he's not good at, at surgery he's just a big beefy beefcake who beats people up um so it's got this hidden series of like story threads that seem to unpick and and sometimes pop out at you uh which is great because honestly i think the writing is is particularly fun in this game it's particularly fun in this game um at the start of the game uh, Cara, would you like to tell us about what you do at the start with regards to your character and the story sheet that you get um, yeah, at the start, uh, you basically pick one of the story sheets or the character sheets. Uh, I think there is like 20 different or so. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and um, basically every uh, 
character has like a constellation and a certain like stereotype and you have to you have a personal character story but you have to fill in five blanks and um, for example you have to name one other pirate group or you have to name a piece of clothing or a piece of fruit or a famous person or something you just you know you just pick something and over the course of the game you unlock your story yeah they call it mad libs yeah and uh, your character story which develops and there are these blanks where you put in the choices you made at the start which can lead to quite interesting yeah like blood joining Marie Curie with a uh, Lego <laughs> Death Star that was that was one of the highlights of the session that was that was wonderful oh. that was wonderful oh. that that and the ongoing narrative between yours and Kara's characters where Kara yeah. Kara's character is the thespian pirate and is constantly bringing you in for your plays and it's very clear that your pirate despises Kara and can't stand uh, these plays and, and you know but I'm just being nice and you're like all I care about is my gold coat plays and, and you know but I'm just being nice and you're like all I care about is my gold coat and then there was my, my pirate he didn't give a damn about anything except extreme safety it was like oh you can't use that cannon that's dangerous somebody somebody might get hurt with that in fact that, that's what happened is my character unloaded all the cannons before one particular important fight that, that's what happened is my character unloaded all the cannons before one particular important fight which was quite like oh no <laughs> I was like, <laughs> my pirate in, in her reflective vest cares very greatly about safety and traveling around with loaded cannons you're just asking for somebody to to, to get their eye put out you know um yeah so yeah to, to get their eye put out you know um yeah so yeah you were the hygiene and security guy i was i was yeah she she was awful um <laughs> that that's yeah you've got 21 different pirates and they have they all have their own little story as you unlock the constellation which is a unique pathway spite like as you unlock the constellation which is a unique pathway spite like it's like a web that you follow and you click on like a constellation you you unlock each star and when you hit exclamation point you get a token that eventually becomes the story piece that unfolds and that's where you to do as Kara just talked about um uh, you have to get a certain number of them. Uh, you have to get a certain number of them uh, to get the better endings for your pirate. So there's this mini game within the game where you're trying to make sure the story succeeds. You don't want to fail because then nobody gets an ending. But you want to try and get as many of your constellation points completed as possible because three possible because three is the bad ending four is the good ending which can be kind of satisfying and five is like the legendary amazing ending uh, which none of us achieved when we played uh, in fact i got the bad ending which turned out to be my character going i told you so to all the crew on the ship after all the characters had left it turned out the ship sailed off and burnt it turned out the ship sailed off and burnt down because i wasn't there to tell them how to be safe anymore i was like well that's a bad ending for them but i mean i guess my character's an annoying know-it-all forever that's that's all right um it, it's i just really love how this game i love how this game it, it, it takes a little bit of time just to get used to it but the the sense of humor and the jokes in it is quite daft uh we landed on one island and i immediately saw that there was a cave and i was like all right, I normally I'm normally slow on this and pick something later, but I'm going for that cave. I want to find out what's in that cave. It's a story event. There's no dice. I know what's in that cave. It's a story event. There's no dice rolls listed. Let's go for it. I rush in there, and a random thing turns up. This is pirates selling pets, and he's like, "Would you like to buy a pet?" And I'm I'm reading this. I'm thinking, "Yeah, I'll buy a pet." And no, my pirate just goes, oh, "I'm going to run him through and rob him." So my pirate <laughs> just goes, "Oh, a pet? My own pet pal? That sounds amazing." Kills him, stealing. Kills him, steals a hippo. So I had a hippo for the rest of the game. I, I, it was meant to help me out in fights. It gave me extra brawn. I never got involved in a fight. So the, I just was the safety pirate plus plus hippo, which was really sweet. When we landed on the island again, um, Audrey, you went in the cave, didn't you? And something very yep, different happened. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you found something else. You, you know, I, I watched uh, a spoiler-free tutorial video of this game, and I think I missed everything of it. Yeah, uh, the mechanics of the game is just, I, I don't, there's not much to them really. Move around mm -hmm. the map, put your piece on a board, roll a dice, more 
the more well you can do, which I like because if you choose to fire cannons, you'll gain aim because you're practicing firing cannons and you'll get better at firing cannons. And then later in the game, where the situations become really important, you've maxed out your aim and people are telling you to fire cannons and you're like, but no, no, I want to do something involving brawn and get that last brawn tick so I can have this one, one brawn away and Profi would not let me go f do the brawn fighting. I'm, I'm a little sore about that. I, I, if you I'll don't want to be backstabbed, don't play with pirates. Well, yeah, exactly. I did. I must admit, like my character did steal Profi's like shirt off his back and then bury it. Oh, in he was so annoyed. I it personally when it happened, but I'd just written his pirate name in my um, book, uh, you know, because that was I had to pick somebody. And then the the my constellation went, and you're going to steal the treasure from him. And I went, okay, well, I'll have <laughs> the shirt then. And then as soon as he got upset, I was like, he's going to be after that the first chance he gets. And I know there's the work the ship opto. <laughs> But yeah, it it's um it definitely a game that like very much gets you into a role playing state of mind at times and has just I think it's just the right amount of friction between players. You're not forced to be uh, awful to other people, but you can. And if you do, it's te generally in a purpose of stealing the trip stars. So they're quite fun and desirable, but you can only have four at maximum. Um, so people who don't bury them often end up just chucking them overboard for supplies. Yeah, like I did. Yeah. But I had good treasures. You did. Yeah, I also like this this game is it's cooperative, but you know, you steal something from the other or um <clears throat> force people to do something. They they would like to do something else and it it's an interesting uh, mixture. Um I Yeah, it's cooperative. It's cooperative, but everyone has a different idea of what cooperation is. Yeah. Um, I, that might have to do with the player count. We play with four players and um, especially like in the second half, I felt like I didn't have that much choice in what I'm doing because um, at some point um, everyone has like maxed out skills and it's clear, okay, you need to do this. And um, I think with more players, um, you have more options. Or even like in the last fight, um, of course, we needed people to fire the cannons. And um, so two players fire the, fire the cannons. And um, so two players fire the cannons. One has to guard the captain. Leaves only one with like freedom of choice, really. And um, that, that was something I didn't enjoy as much uh, but that might work better with uh, more something i didn't enjoy as much uh, but that might work better with uh, more players yeah well, yeah absolutely um well that's kind of what i touched on before I, I have played with more players um and while the game tries to compensate you for having a lower player count by giving you the uh well, the game tries to compensate you for having a lower player count by giving you the uh the hungry pirate section if you ever encounter it is automatically dealt with so somebody gets this pseudo extra action um which resulted in many people deciding to starve the crew when we played which yeah and and we ended the game on max supplies so we, yeah and and we ended the game on max supplies so was it really worth starving them for that but uh, i guess that's what you decided uh, so fair enough um but yeah it, when you have more players i had it once and i decided to feed them you I did remember. you did actually profi starved them yeah um but yeah you get to that kind of state where everyone's in a specialized role kind of state where everyone's in a specialized role this first adventure as well is shorter than the others because it's a bit more introductory so you have less space to kind of dawdle around the ocean and have a few silly adventures and maybe go well i'm not just the aim aim pirate or the navigating pirate i'm also something else um and we something else um and we, if we'd had more time, we I would have suggested we go on a little bit of a detour just to get some more skill pips for people and broaden their characters. But we were we were on a time limit, and we could, I could see that we were approaching the end within like two or three journeys trips. So I was just like, okay, we'll just get there and one point away from having my good ending. I'm a little bitter about that, but it's yeah. fine because it was the whole thing was a lot of fun. Do not worry; it, it doesn't sound like you you are bitter about that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really bitter about notice. it. But I'm role playing bitter about it. I, I imagine my my safety pirate was very unhappy having to fire the cannon those cannons. 
but uh, you know. So yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it, it is. It's a very characterful game. I, I I think there were several moments where the writing made us laugh, like multiple of us, which yeah. was is a good sign if the writing in your game makes you laugh for sure. Winning moment being bludgeoning Mar- the Duchess Marie Curie with uh, the Liga Death Star. That came, that blindsided me because we'd not read that anywhere previously on your sheet, and I purposely avoid looking at other people's sheets. And then you just read that out loud, and it was just this image of her Marie Baroness, or was it Baroness Marie Curie? Duchess. Pr- Duchess Baron. Uh, or was it Baroness Marie Curie? Duchess. Pr- Duchess Baron. Uh, Duchess Baroness Marie Curie's a prized. Uh, Lego Death Star, and you just breaking it over her head and killing her. I was like, oh my goodness! <laughs> and then, and then, of course, because it's really stupid. Your pirate goes, and now I am royalty, and it's like, what? <laughs> what? It's like, what? <laughs> What? That's how you get a, a royalty uh, title. No. <laughs> no, 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 because the text then says that your pirate says that, that yeah, now I'm royalty, but the text says. Actually, that's not how royalty works, so you have done all this for nothing. <laughs> well, uh, okay. a, lot of, a lot of kings and... Uh, and nothing. <laughs> well, uh, okay. a, lot of, a lot of kings and uh, and queens in the, the history of humanity would beg to differ different. They, they would, but uh, it was it was a fun high moment followed by, a, oh, oh dear, <laughs> oh, uh, hubris has come along the calling and now I'm swinging from the, from the gallows. Oops, <laughs> and now I'm swinging from the from the gallows. Oops, <laughs> which was uh, that I think that was the darkest of the endings, but also the one that gave us the biggest laugh. Yeah. And one thing that I have to mention about uh, basically all the games that we've mentioned today is that they're not the most pricey games. Yeah, that, that... that's they're not the most pricey games. Yeah. That... That's always good to to point out, especially since so many games are on the. the yeah, upper none end. of them has uh, miniatures, which uh, often brings the cost uh, down. But for the narrative, they have since it's most of the times uh, have since it's most of the times uh, a book, or uh, in the case of Forgotten Water, the the app, uh, it keeps the cost and the weight of uh, the box down. And and I think that's really something that's interesting, and that right now with the shipping, um, let's say, Lee and with China and with all the container cr- container crisis, I think that's something that many game publishers and game designers could look into to keep their games uh, cheaper, cheaper to ship, uh, smaller to manage, uh, smaller to store on the shelves on a thing. Yeah. Uh- uh, which is exactly the counter tendency of what we had in the latest years, because you got bigger and bigger boxes. You more got, miniatures. Uh, yeah, more ex- more miniatures, more expensive components. You need double and triple layer stuff. And yes, this uh, is actually a big uh, is a is a big uh, wake up call if you want. Yeah. Because probably we will need to change something and make everything more manageable. And also it could be a problem for... Uh, I think that the biggest problem is that for uh, uh, Kickstarters, but uh, there will be backlashes. And actually, related to this, it's probably the fact that more and more games are using apps, right? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so the the Forgotten Waters is one game which makes an extensive use, and uh, I think that the most notable I have in my in my list, which uh, requires an app to work, is my father's work, which is a game I was very very interested in. It had expensive components and stuff, but I was kind of wary of the fact that it doesn't have of you all are about uh, using apps in games I am not opposite to that I actually like when something does the heavy lifting for me but I'm kind of wary for the future availability because if we are talking 5 or 6 years of guaranteed av- availability of the of an app or a website in that legacy game but uh, if you are not guaranteed for 3 2 years um, I kind we'll of see maybe suspicious. when we talk about destinies if we do talk about it. Well, we already did yeah. talk about it. 
you you be very welcome to come back and have a, other thoughts on it in an opening section because I just I just went through it in an opening and then gone back and um, amended that to just say I think I think um, the app in Destinies does what the app in Forgotten Waters does which is it takes a lot of the heavy lifting and um, puts it elsewhere and allows you to just engage with the board game um it's just down to the writing uh i i've i've started to see uh i i've i've started to see on board game geek as well other people with the same sentiment i have which is destinies is an amazing system with bad stories being told that are not replayable or particularly fun or pleasant and actually turn out to have even less sandboxy kind of stuff they're almost like an escape room turn out to have even less sandboxy kind of stuff they're almost like an escape room i think is the way to look mm -hmm. at them rather than a proper adventure thing but the mechanic system is great forgotten waters similar nice thing they've done is it's they've they've designed it that you can download the whole thing um offline and so if you're concerned about that you can download the whole thing um offline and so if you're concerned about that, you can download it offline, you can save that somewhere on, you know, on a file or whatever, your own personal copy, and it will keep the game uh, viable for the future. And then the only thing you need to do is print more yeah. pirate sheets as in when you use them up or yeah. order some more. Yeah, there are games that have an actual app for smartphones, and I, d I despise that um, because especially if you make an Android app, for example, um, there's a high chance that even in two years you won't be able to use it properly. Um, yeah. If you do an app, yeah. please make it as a web app so I can just open it in any browser um, and maybe uh, take a laptop or uh, whatever. I don't have to worry about uh, if I have the right uh, operating system or anything. And um, it should be... be possible to have the experience without an internet connection um, that's something i encountered with midara um, it doesn't have an app itself but it uses the foreteller app for narration or you can use it um, it doesn't work for me because i didn't or you can use it um, it doesn't work for me because i don't have a, a good enough wi-fi in my gaming room so um, yeah, and due to how the app works, usually you can preload sound files, but not for Midara. So I can't use it. Usually you can preload sound files, but not for Midara. So I can't use it in my game. And I think I think we'll talk about the Midara app at some point in the future because uh, I oh, we've been using it recently because uh, we've been playing Midara and yeah, um, Fortel is a nice idea, but there's some issues with its execution some issues with this execution yeah with an app personally uh the, the problem is that when the app functions well it can it can elevate the, the game and can make it work uh nicely although i've rarely seen an app that um a, a game that i would say uh, would be a lot worse without the without its app uh, usually it's it's slightly better slightly easier slightly faster um, but when the app doesn't work, it can really get in the way of the game and the fun. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's kind of my, my position on it, where it's very easy to make an app that dock or that a year later is, is buggy or, or just doesn't work mm -hmm. well. Unless it's open source and the community can fix it and can make it uh, better, then, then that functions. But otherwise, I'm usually uh, kind of worry, wary of them. Uh, I think that the best game that uses an app that I know would be Unlock, um, because Unlock's app is, is very simple and it usually doesn't rely on it too much. But even then, um, if one day that, that app doesn't work, then all of those games are uh, inoperable because because some of them require uh, hints that are only in the app. So yeah. just think like uh, 90s games with VCRs like Atmosphere. <laughs> you can basically play again Atmosphere because there's the entire video transcript uh, in YouTube, but uh, even that one won't last forever. And it's anyway one copyright notice away from being unavailable, being unavailable again. So uh, there are there are always ways to to cope with obsolescence of technologies, but um, 
a web-based app is probably the best option to use an app. I think that the best way of uh, looking at apps is like, well, it is uh, not quite like a legacy game, but it will eventually be unavailable. So I, I don't, I'm not buying this game uh, for my future kids to play. Uh, and I'm not, to I'm not talking about my actual kids. <laughs> I'm talking about metaphorical kids. Uh, so that in 15 years time, someone will play this game again because that probably won't happen. I think a good approach would be, okay, this game is made for an app. Uh, there's a good app which makes uh, the game a lot more enjoyable, but here you have the optional purchase of this book, which has a, is a lot more clumsy, but uh, it uh, completely substitutes the app if you need it. Uh, that's kind of sensible. And what made me think like that is basically a, a, a tiny, mostly insignificant thing like the app in Seven Continents. It was mostly cool, insignificant thing like the app in Seven Continents. It was mostly cool. It, uh, it gives you a soundtrack uh, and so on. But there's a specific item which is entirely optional and doesn't uh, break the courses in the game, which uh, allows you to use aug aug augmented reality and doesn't uh, break the courses in the game, which uh, allows you to use aug aug augmented reality it is uh, mostly in ineffective uh, you, you see just vortexes except uh, in a couple uh, locations but uh, that part uh, it made uh, me really uh, locations but uh, that part uh, it made uh, me really wonder because uh, uh, iPhone libraries evolve and stuff needs updates Android libraries evolve even more wildly, like Kara said, and... Do I want an electronic device on my board game table? And honestly, I don't. Um, usually when I play board games um, and I don't stream them, I don't even have my smartphone in the same room with me because I want to focus on the game. Games and... Um, even though I, for example, agree that the app in Forgotten Waters is, is great and helps a lot, it is a reason for me not to get this game. Um, if they had the option, hey, we have here a book with all the stories and whatnot, you can play it without an app. This first edition and the DM player put an item under the chest that this item was supposed to open in setup. And in some cases, when there are many moving parts, I would say, okay, I agree, I'm going to take the app uh, if it can prevent player mistakes. But okay, I agree, I'm going to take the app uh, if it can prevent player mistakes. But that's uh, the only situation. Okay. Oh, yeah, unlock because you have the timer. Yeah, maybe that's not too much, but that's the extent of it for me. Okay, true story now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the extent of it for me. Okay, true story now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I um, when I was a kid, uh, my my father, which was uh, kind of an anti-literam ner nerd, uh, he, he bought uh, the original Dark Tower game. Okay, it had he bought uh, the original Dark Tower game. Okay, it had uh, this tower which illuminated and stuff. It lasts since I was a small kid. When we got the game, I have a, I had a bigger brother and no little brother yet. So uh, basically, I destroyed the game. <laughs> I destroyed the tower and everything. And it we had a basically mint game with a destroyed tower, which made it unusable. Uh, now now, now uh, I have my <laughs> I have my hand at uh, electronic engineering so uh, I repaired it uh, later but uh, I, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to play that game again after six months we bought it and uh, when I saw the new Kickstarter which uh, returned to that tower new improved mechanics just for nostalgia factor I wanted to buy it it uh, was actually engineered very cool. Was actually engineered very cool because 
a lot of stuff is uh, changeable and you can repair a lot of the stuff but still I couldn't force myself to to shield two hundred dollars or something like that to get a game uh, to to shield two hundred dollars or something like that to get a game of, with which I was burnt because uh, well that was a nineties version of obsolescence. Yeah, yeah, it's um, there's not too many of those games that have uh, held in people's um. There's not too many of those games that have uh, held in people's consciousness. Dark Tower obviously is one, and um, uh, Atmosphere is definitely one. I think Atmosphere is so yeah. popularly famous because of how brilliant the performances of the actors behind those rubbery <laughs> masks and how uh, Silence Worm! Yes. Go <laughs> to Black Hole! <laughs> yeah. There, uh, but, um... No, th- those games are actually... Uh, cultural milestones because they are very cool they are great they are great because of the gimmicks they employ but is it worth it i i really don't know yeah i mean you're you're right it's it's always a bit of a question really on how long a board game's life is supposed to be i mean i i have warhammer quest still sat on my shelf um not that i really play it but it's completely intact when I got it in 2008. Yeah, I'd say 94 or 95. Yeah, so, but uh, I, I think it's fine for, yeah, it was 1995. It's fine for a game to be consumable, um, but maybe with these bigger games, yeah, that's a bit more of a harder pill to swallow, like you said, um, my, a harder pill to swallow, like you said, um, my, uh, my father's work, which sounds super, super cool. I did back it in the end after like dithering about whether I was going to or not. Um, but I am very aware that how long is this one going to be around um, and in a playable state? And it's, it's not um, and in a playable state and it's, it's not a cheap uh, experience. It's a very uh, physically extravagant game. Um, I think they're using yeah. glass bottles uh, as some of the components, like little cast glass yeah. vials. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. But then you have no long-term plan for this item. Amazing. But then you have no long-term plan for this item. Um, like, what happens as you're a small company if if the app stuff stops working in within five years? Like. It's a... If you change a website domain, you won't remember it in ten years. Yeah, um, so I I don't know, but they did state an eight hundred page spiral book to support it. Um, oh well, maybe you should consider doing that a couple of years down the line. You should definitely do it if you're not reprinting the game and you're looking to retire the electronics. Otherwise, like uh, aftermath or Comanauts, which I'm looking at right now, I could play those for forever. They're just spiral books. Pull the book on the table. Often it's where we end up with that. But uh, uh, Forgotten Waters at least took some steps to try and let people keep the game of the uh, the game preserved over the years by giving you the tools needed to create your own offline copy and. You know, you could stick it on a USB stick and put that inside the box, or if you prefer, you can burn it in your computer. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, but some kind of physical medium that sits there and you can re-upload it onto whatever device can work a web browser. Which we should always have one of those for as long as we're around. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, for Forgotten Waters case, at least it's. Yeah, anyway, for Forgotten Waters case, at least, it's uh, it's fair enough. Yeah, I think uh, that sort of brings us to a, a point where we're starting to discuss apps rather than the games. But um, uh, I, does anyone have anything else they'd like to say about these? Uh, uh, I, does anyone have anything else they'd like to say about these? Uh, not specifically about these, but just uh, for one of the, the next episodes, uh, I'm planning to, to go uh, spend a few days at Audrey's in the, in the upcoming month to play uh, as much Midra as we can, as much Midra as we can, uh, without getting uh, sick of it. <laughs> uh, so in, in a couple of episodes, we'll probably have a, an episode specifically designed to, to talk about Midra. Yep, I'm also and playing Madara. Yeah, we'll we'll touch on Fortella. Yeah, I'm also playing Madara. The same. Okay. Cool. 
Right then, last order. Any final business? Nope. 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 Uh, so that's all we have time for this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or as the last standee on Twitter. I'm the second E in standee, stands for escapade. <laughs>